Why do children develop cancer? This is a question of great importance that has been baffling scientists for a long time. In this video, we will explore two new theories to understand why children develop cancer based on a critical evaluation of the current medical literature. Although not yet proven, these two theories provide new insights into the origins of childhood cancer. Let's start with some basic information. Cancer is a state of uncontrolled cell multiplication that eventually takes over the body. To understand how this happens, you need to understand genes. Genes reside in the 23 pairs of chromosomes inside the nucleus of every cell. Genes control every activity of that cell. Each gene has a duplicate. The second one is a backup in case something goes wrong with the first gene. Only one of them is active at a time. For example, there are two genes that tell the cell when to divide, and two genes to tell the cell when to stop dividing. Each time a cell divides, it duplicates genes for the daughter cells. However, accidents can happen, and each accident is called a mutation. In addition to accidents that can occur when cells divide, mutations can also occur because of many factors, such as exposure to UV light, ionizing radiation from the sun, radioactive rays in x-rays, reactive chemicals in the environment from industry, or ingested in foods we eat, or from oxidative damage from oxygen radicals released during aerobic metabolism inside the cell. There are billions of cells in the body, and mutations are actually very common. But nature empowered cells with mutations to have multiple mechanisms to repair themselves, or to self-destruct in a process called apoptosis. If these mechanisms do not work, the body's immune system destroys cells that have gene mutations. However, some cells with mutations escape detection the problem is, if the mutation occurs on both copies of the genes that stop cell division, the cell could keep dividing and dividing because the daughter cells also carry the same mutation. Each generation of new cells continues to divide uncontrollably. This is cancer. There is no question that in adults, the accumulation of mutations over time can finally lead to cancer. But since a child's brief lifespan is not conducive to such an accumulation of mutations, the question we must ask is, why do children develop cancer? At this time, the most widely accepted model among oncologists to explain childhood cancer is called the two-hit hypothesis, proposed by Alfred Knudsen. The hypothesis starts with the concept that genes in a fetus suffer a first hit that gives the child a predisposition to cancer. The nature of this first hit and how it damages the cell is unknown. Then in some children, there is a second hit that triggers the cancer. The nature of this second hit and the mechanism of cancer cell formation is also unknown. So is there another theory? The rest of this video will explore two explanations as to how a cancer cell might form in the fetus and later, in the child's life, develop into full-blown cancer, even with no mutation. The earliest cells that begin to form after the sperm enters the ovum are called stem cells. They are just like the very first cells that divided on Earth, which I call the atom cell, because they use an internal signal to activate cell division. Starting in the embryo, the body produces totally potent stem cells that divide in response to their internally generated signals. These stem cells can become any type of cell in the body. Later, totally potent cells become pluripotent, meaning they get assigned to a location where they divide to create the cells needed only to function in a specific organ. When a totally potent stem cell becomes pluripotent, it deactivates the response mechanism to divide based on internal signals. Instead, it divides based on signals coming from outside the cell.
Now that you understand more about stem cells, we can explore two ways in which stem cells might cause the most common childhood cancers. For the first way, imagine that something goes wrong inside a pluripotent stem cell. For example, the mitochondrion where the cell's power is produced might not form correctly, or it does not produce enough power, or it experiences a lack of oxygen, or it's altered due to radiation. Now suppose, during the transition to pluripotency, the stem cell has already fabricated the receptor to decode external signals. However, when it responds in an attempt to create more cells, the lack of a functional mitochondrion to burn the fuel creates a very acidic environment inside the cell, similar to what happened in the atom cell. The acidity keeps increasing due to ongoing metabolic activity. To survive, the cell reactivates its original ability to divide on its own. Then, if the daughter cells also show the same propensity to divide, this pluripotent stem cell is effectively a cancer cell in waiting, hiding in the body, ready to divide at any time. This could explain childhood cancers such as leukemia or lymphoma. The second way a stem cell can become a cancer cell might explain the cause of brain cancer in children. For example, in the fetus, pluripotent stem cells assigned to create nerve cells are sent to the site of the head. This movement has to be precise, and the cells must position themselves properly with regard to location and orientation. But imagine that a stem cell is lost or becomes unattached from the others, and it becomes an orphan cell. Then let's say, the orphan cell responds to the signal to divide, but because it is not a recognized member of the local group, it fails to respond to the signal to stop dividing. This stem cell is effectively a cancer cell in waiting, hiding in the body, ready to divide at any time. In both of these methods, the reversion to atom cell status and the orphan cell, we can see how stem cells can form a cancer without any mutation of genes in the nucleus. I believe these two explanations about stem cells help us to understand the formation of the most common childhood cancers, and perhaps one day will help us to prevent them or to push them into remission at the earliest time possible. For more information on this video, we invite you to read this new book from Dr. John.